first, a word of thanks. Uh, this has just been a tremendous experience for me. The conference has been absolutely outstanding. And it is a mark of the organizers, um, uh, I think, not only brilliant organizational skills, but clever choices with respect to, to invitations. To, to come on the heels of such a great program is indeed an honor. But also, I think it's a very important symbol of what this whole building and maybe this institution are about. Because what we've seen is people from multiple different fields coming together. And it's so easy to see with these juxtapositions how important it is to have these conversations. I wish we had another day just to hear uh, Joe Dummett talk to Adrian Rain. I wish we had another day to hear Pat Churchland talk to Steve Pinker. There's so much synergy, but also disagreements, methodological questions, uh, and I think uh, we can't make as good progress in our own individual areas of the academy uh, without talking to people who are in other areas. It doesn't happen often enough. Hopefully the conversation started here will go on and affect all of our work. So I'm extremely grateful to the organizers for all of that, and I think we should thank them. For that. Just one more word along those lines, in addition to, uh, to Stephanie and, and Philip, the people who have been working behind the scenes to get us a room to sit in, to get us food to eat, uh, to get us on camera and to exploit us later. All of those <laughs> folks have contributed. It's been a magnificent experience, so one more round for them. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about is really a, an old question about the role of reason versus emotion in moral judgment. So moral judgment is just something like the, the conclusion that a certain form of conduct is good or bad. When you say that it's, it's a bad to have an inheritance tax, that that's morally in, inappropriate, or it's good to have an inheritance tax, that's morally appropriate, you're making some moral judgment. And what's going on when we do that? Uh, there's a rationalist tradition that says this is primarily a function of reasoning, that when you arrive at a moral conclusion, it's through a reasoning process, and the conclusion you report is itself a kind of cool, rational state. Uh, but as against this tradition, there's a, there's a long and distinguished history of thinking that emotions are actually playing a central role in this process. It's a tradition that's associated with certain British philosophers, uh, of the 18th century, but has continued very much uh, today. And the philosophical debates in this area, like any area, um, go on and on and on. Philosophy is an old field, and it's an old field for a reason, which is that where philosophical methods are extremely good at identifying positions and articulating theories and drawing conclusions uh, from evidence, their methodology is not optimally suited for the actual accrual of evidence which is to say when philosophers come to the table and try and dispute a, a position, their skills as polemicists tend to lead to debates that don't ever get resolved. So some of these questions that have been going on for a couple hundred years would go on interminably if we continued doing pure philosophy, continued doing business as usual. So the interdisciplinarity offers us an opportunity to increase the philosophical tool chest and assess some of these old theories. And what I want to try and do is walk through some evidence that suggests that the people who said emotions are important to morality were right. That there's a tremendous amount of research coming out that's consistent with this view. Um, and the research takes a variety of forms. Um, because it's a panel on um, emotions, sorry, on morality and the brain, um, I could have spent a long time showing you slides like this. And that had been my plan, but then when Joe gave his talk just now, <laughs> uh, so during your lunch break, I feverishly eliminated every brain scan. <laughs> Um, I'll say a little bit about the brain. There, there are now many, many studies, a few dozen studies, looking at moral decision-making, moral judgment, um, using methodologies like fMRI, where we see metabolic changes as a result of, of moral judgment. And it's, it, uh, the summary thing to say about these uh, results is that in every study done, every single one of them, except for one condition in one study, uh, which was poorly designed, emotion structures of the brain have been uh, big players in, in morality. And by emotion structures of the brain, I mean if you do a brain scan to try and figure out what's going on when someone has an emotion, you get them angry or upset in the lab, 
and measure brain activity. The same structures that occur when people are in emotional states are big players when they're making, making moral judgments. And I, I won't walk you through the slides, so I hope you can see that just by some of the diversity of areas here with labels like the insula, anterior cingulate cortex. Uh, one thing you don't tend to see in these slides is a, is a little guy called the amygdala. And when Adrian Rain said all emotion researchers agree that, that the amygdala is the seat of emotions, um, that's simply false. The amygdala is one brain structure that plays a role in the induction of certain emotions, especially fear, under very specialized conditions, especially using visual um, materials. And it, its activation tends to play a role in orchestrating other brain structures that are involved in emotional response. Uh, but it need not be there in order to have uh, emotions. Even fear can be experienced by people whose amygdalae have been, have been destroyed through disease. So that's just a, a, just a, a brief uh, corrective remark. The emotional brain involves a lot of different structures, and their, and their roles are very intensively studied. Um, now, neuroscience is correlational, and what we get out of the neuroimaging results is evidence that emotion structures of the brain are active when people make moral judgments. But are they really contributing to those moral judgments, and if so, how? For that, really moving from neuroscience into behavioral psychology becomes important. And, um, and there's a lot of evidence emerging that emotions actually influence the moral judgments that we make. Um, and you can show this in various ways. The basic strategy is induce an emotion in the lab and see how it affects people's judgments. So uh, this, uh, this slide corresponds to a, uh, a study that uh, my student, Kendall Eskin, um, just published, uh, where we induced emotions through uh, beverage choice. And people were given either a sweet beverage, a neutral beverage, or a bitter beverage. And the basic finding was that if you give people questions about morality after tasting these different things, that nasty, bitter beverage makes people morally more judgmental. So, <laughs> so here's a vignette. Tim is a graduate student. He likes to have library books at home to help him with his research. But the library won't allow him to check, uh, to check out any more books since he has so many overdue. He started to simply leave with the books from the library without checking them out. So you're asked on a scale, one to seven, how wrong is this? And everybody thinks this is kind of wrong. I mean, it's bad to steal library books. Um, but if you've been drinking these different beverages, the degree of wrongness goes, uh, goes up. Um, this can be shown in a lot of different ways. So our study is just one of many of this kind. Uh, this is a, uh, a vignette that was used in the study by Simona Schnall and her colleagues. So she said, Frank's dog was killed by a car in front of his house. So he cut up the body and cooked it and ate it for dinner. How wrong was that? So how wrong is it to eat your pet dog if your pet dog is killed by a car? Most people think this is kind of wrong. It's not exactly genocide, but it's sort of a, you, you'd be a little bit dubious about Frank. In this study, uh, the researchers seated subjects either at a nice, tidy desk like this or a really nasty one. So the nasty one had a chewed up pencil and a greasy pizza carton and an old chalky soft drink container and a snotty tissue. And um, when you're exposed to these kinds of disgusting environmental uh, elements, your ratings of wrongness go up. Uh, in the same paper, the authors used a very sophisticated piece of psychological <laughs> <laughs> And they were able to produce the same effect. So induction of disgust. In fact, this is this is a wonderful paper to read because of the technical language used to uh, to report the results. So they refer to the four spray, the two spray, and the no spray condition. And the, the four spray condition is one where everybody kind of comes into the setting where the study is done, which is on the campus of Stanford. Uh, and they're just you know appalled by the smell. But the, the two spray condition, people barely notice that there's any any smell there. But even in that condition. They, they get the effect that if people give harsher moral judgments when disgust has been induced. Um, I, in some work, uh, some unpublished work with Simona Schnall, who did those, those uh, the fart spray study, uh, we got interested in whether anger uh, is also capable of affecting people's moral judgments. We induced anger, in this case, through autobiographical recall, so just remember some event when you were really, uh, really angry. And then we gave them a lot of different vignettes about morality. And, uh, and we found it also inflated their, their moral ju judgment. So in a, this is just what, what uh, one of the data points looks like. This was a vignette about a trolley driver. We talked about trolleys the other day. A trolley driver who's speeding towards five people on a track and decides to veer off to an alternate track where only one person will be killed. 
Under our control condition, most people didn't think this was bad behavior. It was below the midpoint on our scale. But after anger induction, people thought this trolley driver had made uh, the wrong choice. Um, so there's a lot of evidence that emotions are actually influencing our moral judgments. Um, a stronger claim would be that they're really required from moral judgments. So um, one way to think about this is to, is to meditate on moral education. It turns out that babies are kind of crafty. They're kind of bad little guys, right? You know, we like them. They're cute. They've got big eyes and stuff. But they're really nasty critters. So babies scream, and they poo in their pants, and they hit you, and they bite. You know, if you hold up a baby, you're being sweet and saying goo goo gaga, and it will smack you and try and tear your eyes out. <laughs> if adults did that, we would send them off to Sing Sing, right? This is not behavior we consider socially acceptable. So we need to work to get our babies to be good. Um, so I, that, that, that uh, US News uh, cover, Born Bad, I believe with Adrian Rain that, yes, Born Bad, but it's all of them, you know, it's not just. <laughs> So how do we fix that? Um, one answer is that we fix it through emotional conditioning. So if you look at the methods that are efficacious in making kids develop a sense of, uh, of morality or of social rules more generally, the techniques that emerge are basically three. One of them is what's called euphemistically power assertion. And power assertion uh, doesn't necessarily involve um, uh, the physical contact, but some sort of threat of physical punishment. Even more effective than power assertion is something called um, induction of empathy. So you, you draw the child's attention to the fact that she has maybe made another child cry. So empathy is maybe a little bit of a, of a heavy uh, word here. But really what's going on is kids are very prone to vicarious distress. If one kid sees another kid crying, they can start to, to become upset too. And by drawing children's attention to how they've made others suffer, this, this kind of emotional mirroring can, can take place. And the final method that really turns out to be most effective is love withdrawal. And that's a kind of social ostracism. It's go have a time out, go to your room, I'm not going to play with you anymore, I don't like young girls like you. All of those kinds of parental interventions that threaten the attachment relationship between child and parent are very upsetting. So by inducing fear, by inducing uh, a, a kind of empathetic distress, and by inducing the sadness associated with breaking the social bond between parent and child, children come to form negative associations, negative emotional associations, with bad conduct. So it does look like we need to engage in this kind of conditioning practice in order to get our, our, our kids to be good. It contrasts strikingly with the case of language, where we don't need to do a lot of explicit instruction. There's a fa famous argument, the most famous argument maybe in cognitive science, for the claim that language is innate, that we're born with a linguistic capacity. And it goes like this. In order for kids to learn language from scratch, without any language learning abilities, you need to give them negative feedback. You need to correct them when they go wrong. Kids don't get much by way of correction for the grammatical errors, yet they come out to be linguistically competent adults. That's used as an argument for the claim that language is innate. I, for technical reasons, I don't even think it's especially a convincing argument in the language um, domain, because I think they actually are finding ways to get negative feedback. But in the moral domain, that argument is a non-starter. It doesn't even get off the ground. Kids get a lot of correction. In fact, between the second and the ninth birthday, kids are corrected for behavioral transgression every six to nine minutes of waking life. So, uh, for those, how many parents are in the room of young, of young kids? So, you know, they're always like, you know, speaking too loudly or putting their hands in their mouths or doing something wrong. And we, we spend a lot of time trying to correct them. Um, another reason for thinking that morality requires emotion comes from studies of pathological populations. So, so this is a, this, uh, is a, a psychopath, or at least a, a, car, a cartoon version, a Hollywood version. If you look at congenital um, psychopaths we have from, from Adrian Rain, data suggesting that their brain structures are not up to the task of emotional learning. So the kinds of conditioning we just talked about are less effective with, with congenital psychopaths than with the rest of us. So I think this, this much of, uh, of Adrian's story is right. And a consequence of this is a profound deficit in comprehension of the moral domain. It's not just that psychopaths do bad things. It's not just that they have antisocial behavior. They actually don't fully understand morality the way the rest of us do, or most of us do. 
uh, we apparently the incidence of psychopathy is about one in a hundred. So I, my guess is that there's a psychopath in this room. Might be uh, for 